Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to the STP training webinar, Automated Exploratory Testing. Our speaker for the day is Justin Eisen. And um, for anyone who just saw the screen, and uh, I guess it was mentioned as Jason, uh, apologies from our end, uh, it's Justin Eisen. And I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself, and I'm super excited to host you all and Justin on our STP trainings. So Justin, uh, I remember you spoke at the last STP con that was held at Washington in September this year. So how was your experience and anything specific that you liked? Yeah, no, it went, went very well. Um, the conference I thought was very well run. Um, I think uh, a lot of the speakers that were there are a lot of people that I've looked up to or have read their blogs throughout my career. And yeah, there was a lot of good talks. And I think it's a, it's a good conference for networking and for other like-minded uh, people in, in your industry. And uh, I guess just to uh, reflect on some of the talks, um, I unfortunately didn't get to see a lot because I had to uh, man the booth uh, for the company I worked for. But um, the one talk um, was with Peter Kim and his um, refactoring of a different way of um, using page objects. I found very interesting and something that I want to to look in the future of doing it myself. Very nice, thank you. Um, okay, so for all our listeners today, let me tell you, uh, we have our next conference coming up, spring 2018, STPCon, uh, to be held in the Newport Beach, California, from April 9th through 12th next year. So, and our program committee has already started to review the submissions and have started filling, this, uh, filling out the slots. Our keynotes have got finalized and workshops too, and the overall program will be out uh, very, very soon for all of you. And I'm so looking forward to the really power packed program. Uh, the conference topics this time include uh, automation, agile, performance, DevOps, mobile security, leadership, strategy, and so much more. Uh, we typically have over 20 workshops and about uh, 40 sessions for you to choose from. And the formats are like uh, case studies, hands-on exercises, tool demos, uh, really more on the experience side than really theoretical papers. And as I mentioned, that the complete program will be very soon published for you to explore at uh, stpcon.com. And if you register before uh, 31st of December, you get to save up to $500. That's a pretty significant saving, I must say. And, and as STP is now expanding its offerings, we are coming up with the, with the new STP membership programs. The details shall be out soon, so keep looking for it. And since Justin is here and he works with Apply Tools, I would like to take a moment to talk about them. Uh, we really have uh, had a very long and supportive relationship with them. So, um, and I, I, Apply Tools also happens to be our Sapphire sponsor for the Spring Conference. So, thank you, Apply Tools, uh, not only just for the sponsorship but the amazing technical partnership we have with you. We truly appreciate the relationship. Um, and we are actually looking forward for the demo, advanced test automation techniques for uh, responsive apps and sites. That is to happen at the spring 2018 STP con. Uh, the speaker for which will be none other than Moshe Milman himself, who's also the co-founder and CEO for Apply Tools. I say this on every webinar and the regular attendees, please excuse me for doing so, but like all the other thoughts in life, it's good to repeat the ones that really help others. So the thought is, as a tester myself, I have found conferring to be one of the best ways to learn and also to get to know reputed testers across the globe. Build network connections, and I hope all of you find it to be the same way. And if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers' connections. We love the shout outs. And if you hear something uh, you like during the webinar, please tweet about it and use at Software Test Pro for a retweet from us. All right, All right, so let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome, Justin. We are very thrilled to have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Justin is a senior success engineer at Apply Tools. Previously, he was a senior software engineer at Microsoft Berlin. Germany, working on the Wonderlist app. He has over 17 years of experience working on software quality, with the last six primarily uh, developing servers, uh, web, and uh, mobile uh, test automation. 
He's passionate about test automation and loves finding new, efficient, and effective ways to improve software quality with software. Uh, all right, Justin, very warm welcome again, and the floor is all yours now. So thank you, Smita. Um, just want to introduce myself again. I, my name is Justin Eisen. I am a senior success engineer at Apple Tools. For those of you that don't know what Apple Tools is, it's, um, we specialize in visual test automation. Uh, we create SDKs to easily um, import into your automation frameworks to uh, do visual test automation. And today I'm going to talk to you about automated exploratory testing. So let's get started. So the agile world moves fast and it's up to us to keep up. You know, in today's software world, especially on the mobile side, the time to market is becoming increasingly, increasingly shorter. You know, when I first started my career before agile ever existed, it was quite normal to have two or three month iterations, but nowadays you're lucky to get you know, one or two weeks. You know, companies want to continually, because of this, companies want to continually push out new features to keep ahead of their competition. So that's reducing the time. I'm also seeing a lot of trend lately that a lot of companies are going with QA less environments, you know, re less requiring the developers to test as well. So not only do they have to develop the application, but they have to then test the application. And in my opinion, those are two different skill sets. And because of this, you know, less time is being allocated to, you know, exploratory and manual testing of applications. I've seen many companies, you know, very large and small are relying more and more on their end users or customers to report issues that they find. Oops. Sorry about that. I've seen a lot of companies um, don't run a whole lot of UI automation or testing. They are relying so only solely on telemetry or analytics. However, the, the problem with that is you only get so much from analytics. You're not going to see, you're not going to get UI issues or locale or any design flaws from analytics. And then relying solely on the pro on these approaches, and in my opinion, you know, only opens you up to scrutiny and poor opinions about your software quality. And then, in, in my opinion, also is there's just not enough software options on the market today to help fill the quality gaps because of the short release and testing time. So here's the testing pyramid. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with it. This is the testing pyramid I've always looked at or referred to. Some people flip it over and make it an ice cream cone. Um, but for, for this example, this is the test pyramid that I, I use. However, it's probably a little bit more like this in today's market, where you only have a little bit of time and area uh, devoted to the pinnacle for uh, manual and exploratory testing. So my goal, what I wanted to do was automate the best I could um, exploratory testing of native mobile applications. So I wanted to help or create something to help fill the quality gaps of this shortened release and testing time, which I mentioned previously. I wanted to know more about my application on every single build and then store a history of the information I found. I wanted to capture all the elements on all my different views and know which elements had accessibility labels and which did not. And I wanted to capture all the unique images and views throughout my application, you know, for every resolution and orient orientation that I supported. And then provide an easy solution for uh, people to see exactly what the current state of the app was. So no longer do people have to then go and install the application on their phone to see what it looked like on that particular build. They could just go into a web page and see all the different images of what the last release of your uh, build looked like. So product owners, designers, QA people, whoever could actually see what the latest build is. So I also wanted to capture any errors or exceptions that occurred while doing ex automated exploratory testing. Find any language or locale issues that may be there. 
capture performance data. Um, as I'm crawling through my application, I want to make sure that the, um, the, the performance data is captured and generate unique telemetry data. So I do believe in telemetry. It has its place. It is important. Um, a lot of people go through the technique of implementing their telemetry tests within their UI automation frameworks or any type of automation framework. However, the problem with that is it's consistently going to be the same every single time. But if you have something to uh, randomize your testing, um, as such as a crawler or monkey tester, you'll get a more robust telemetry data, in my opinion. So you could tweak it to fit your needs better. And I wanted the, re the ability to replay a crawl or a test after any code fix has been made. If, it, if I detect an issue, I want to be able to replay it so I could verify that the issue has been fixed. And I also didn't want to create something that didn't care about the app's current state. So just as if I you know, was a developer, I had the phone, and I handed it to you, I wanted to create a tool that could go and just test it just like a human would do without having to do any test setup, create accounts, create test data, just go ahead and run with it. And I also wanted to create something that was cross-platform. Since I'm running Appium under the hood, and Appium supports multiple platforms, I could do this. And that benefit is now uh, larger companies like Microsoft are contributing to Appium, which they just recently released WinApp Driver, which you can automate Windows desktop applications using Appium, as long as there's another tool that you can automate desktop applications for Macs. So in theory, I could automate four different platforms all using this tool. So the new test pyramid would be something like this with using my tool as part of your uh, development process, where you're still going to have everything that you had before. There is a place for automated UI tests, but then you have just another layer on top of it to help alleviate uh, the shortened test time that you have, where you, you can have a, an automation tool that will check things for you that a human doesn't have to. And again, it's very important to still have a human check the app just because there's something that a machine just can't do that a human can. So what led me here? So I once worked for a company that was very big on dog feeding our own application. And those of you that don't know what dog feeding is, essentially it's just an industry term for testing your own application in-house before you do any type of releases. However, there was a slight problem with this approach is the majority of the people in the company were Apple fans. So only our iOS and Mac apps got the most attention, the most feedback. And thus became a problem with our less popular platforms. We weren't getting a whole lot of feedback from about them. We also had a very small QA team of actually two people, which only had to, which also had to do support. So it was next to impossible for them to do all the exploratory manual testing of all our different platforms that we had, which was around six. And there was times when uh, the wrong design was implemented, or by the time we were about to release, we found out it wasn't preferred anymore. So I wanted to have something that gave us up to date what the designs were of, of the impl implementation of that application so we could catch these issues before it was too late in the process. And the pain of automating and re-automating tests, constantly fixing and revising tests due to code or design changes. So those of you that have done UI test automation before may be able to relate to this. You know, you spend hours and hours, you know, making it the perfect automation framework. Your tests are all green only to come in the next day and everything's red. Where, you know, I am passionate about test automation. I, you know, I've dedicated my career to it, um, but there's only so much you can do where it starts testing your sanity. And I've definitely felt like this guy here in the video before. So I also like, and you know, when people ask me about test automation, you know, I liken it to writing, um, uh, to the people who have to remove graffiti. You know, you spend hours doing something only to have to redo it again. So, 
So I thought there had to be a better way. So what is an app crawler? An app crawler is much like a web crawler, which some of you uh, may know about or have seen, or a spider or robot. It's a program that is designed to emulate user interactions, a self-automating program that interacts with the components that are available in the UI, much like a user would. The test metrics. So the device orientation. You know, I'm guilty of this, um, but a ma majority of people only test their application portrait orientation. Um, you know, how will you know your app's uh, usability and its flow if you're not testing it in landscape, if you support both? So it's something that needs to be done. But again, if you have a short amount of time, how are you going to uh, test all these? You know, what happens when you rotate the screen? This is actually an example where an issue did occur on this particular application where I did flip it and the screen went blank. You can see on the left, it should have contained some of that content in this um, orientation, but it didn't. And I just want to note that this particular application um, is WordPress. It's an open, open source uh, application. It's a it's really great um, app. It supports multiple languages, uh, different uh, orientations and different operating systems, so it's perfect for a demo app. So I'm, I'm, you're going to see some more examples as going forward, and by no means am I picking on it. This is like straight out of GitHub, and it's their alpha version, and so there will be some bugs that will be found by this tool. So device resolution. Again, most people only test with the device resolutions that are available to them. So if you only have a couple of phones that you have in, you know, available to you in your QA department or development, how are you going to know that your designs and everything that you've put together actually look and function correctly on all the different resolutions you support, unless you actually test it? You know, hopefully you won't encounter a problem like this or like this. OS versions. You see in this particular one, it's Android. There's what around 14 different Android versions now. And again, most people only will test uh, against the OS versions that they have available to them. So if you support all 14 Android versions, how are you going to verify that your app looks and functions correctly on all those different versions unless you actually go and test them? Language. You know, I'm guilty of this too. Majority of people only test in their native tongue. But how do you know your app's layout and its look and feel and navigation and everything is going to behave correctly in all the different languages unless you actually validate it? You know, how are you going to know your designs and your layout are correct for languages such as Arabic, where everything's from right to left, whereas in Western languages, everything's from left to right? So these are important because the developer or um, uh, designer made the, made the assumption that everything's going to be from left to right, whereas when switch this language, everything is broken. And same goes for uh, languages with predominantly longer strings. Again, the designer or developer may have uh, made the assumption that only up to X number of characters, like five, but the equivalent word in Deutsch may be 15 characters long. And again, you wouldn't know unless you actually tested it in German to find that out. So test overload. So now you can see there are so many different variables which they count for. You know, how are you going to do test all these different combinations in such a shortened release and um, release cycle time? I mean, you could possibly do this with all with UI test automation. But then again, UI test automation is only going to be, it's only going to do what's programmed in the test. You need an army, you know, if you were going to do it, you'd need a large army of engineers to pull off all the different combinations. Or you can perhaps hire an army of zombie testers. It's probably not recommended, though. 
And then if you were somehow able to pull it off, you know, automating every uh, scenario would be next to impossible to maintain. So if your app changed on a, a future release, you would have a ton of technical debt that you'd have to then go in and refactor for all those different scenarios, which would make it impossible. So it just can't be that hard. These are my famous last words. So when I first got in the first started the project, you know, I was like, oh, this will be easy. You know, I'll just go and grab all the screen elements and loop through them and click them. That was actually the easy part. You know, the hard part was actually handing all all the unknown condition conditionals and edge cases that can occur, especially when you're trying to build something to work on multiple different apps and UI flows. You know, how do I detect unique locators? How do I rescue the app when it gets stuck? You know, how do I handle different processes when a crash occurs? How do I then go collect all the performance metrics, log errors, um, grab only unique screenshots, and identify all the accessibility labels? These were all things I had to learn as I was implementing this. And then how do I program, programmatically detect any language issues? Some other challenges, you know, hybrid web views that will never end. So a lot of native applications these days have uh, embedded web views in them. So in, in what can happen is as you're crawling through your application, it can go into a web view, click a link on the web view, which will take you to another page and you click another link on that will take you to another page. And before you know it, you're crawling the entire uh, internet. You know, handling authentication or accidental logout. Well, a lot of apps of these days um, require you to authenticate before you do anything in the application. So you have to build logic to detect when you're on a login screen and then go ahead and log in with whatever credentials you pass. And then same with accidental logout, whereas if whatever hat something happened and you were logged out of the application, you need to have a way to recover and lock you back in. Same goes for exiting the app by mistake. Something could happen that puts you back into your device's home screen. You need to add logic to be able to bring you back into the app where you just were. And then also excluding out certain elements from ever being tapped. So one example would be like the logout button. You want to stay in the application to crawl through it, but you don't want to tap the logout button. So you need the add the logic to make sure that it never gets tapped. And gestures, and when to appropriately use them. A lot of apps these days, and native applications, um, use gestures to do different functionality, like swiping left and right, and force press, or force touch, um, tap and hold. And these are all different gestures that do different logic in your application, and you just need to know when to properly use these. And apps are built to be used by humans and not machines. So a lot of times when people ask me about test automation, this is what I say to them. And it's what the difficulty of, is of building software to test software that is meant to be used by humans. It can be sometimes tricky. You know, difficulty of finding the uniqueness in the DOM when you return, when you're crawling through the app. You know, you get parent and child elements that can execute the exact same functionality, but not necessarily, not necessarily always. So you don't always want to exclude those. And then you get into, you can get into a, a problem of, you know, text values of an element can change, or, and then so do the locators attributes. And then you get into, uh, you could get into a problem of an en endless loop of interacting with a new object that you just created modifying that new object, then creating a new object and it's a endless cycle. So you have to add logic to prevent that from occurring. And then you get views layered on top of views on top of views. You know, just getting the elements that are visible on the top layer of what a human would see is sometimes difficult. And it's an algorithm that I'm constantly tweaking to make it better and more robust. 
So here's a video of a crawling example, hence the name crawling. Uh, crawling is slow, but it's not that it's slow. There's a lot happening in the background you just can't see. You know, it's it's getting all the elements, it's it's getting all the strings, it's getting the performance data, it's actually doing stuff on the UI, you just don't necessarily see it. Um, but again, it's crawling and it's going through your application for you and something that it you as a human doesn't need to do. It's a machine that's doing that. And we'll go on. So say I've crawled, I've gone through all my different examples, or I've, I've run all my different scenarios, and now I have my images. And this is great because this now, these are the images that my designers, my developers, my QA people, or whoever in the company can actually see what the latest app looks like. So I got my, I know what the version number of the app is, the language, the OS version, its or um, resolution, and what orientation it was. So this is good because now I can see what my app looks like in, in this orientation. Um, next example, I think it's going to come up is, it's going to show this keyboard open with only just a little sliver of space to see. So in my opinion, that's not a good UI experience. Um, so this raises the question that maybe the designer or developer can implement a better solution to that. Here's application in a, as a, in a tablet, higher resolution. You can see a lot of these images are just stretched. And this is good for everybody to see because this raises the question that instead of stretching the images, maybe you should implement, you know, either its own tablet version of the application or maybe a split view where it will shrink the uh, images and not make them stretched. Uh, yeah, here's this example is going into Arabic. So you can see here, um, there's a lot of English text showing up on a lot of these pages should obviously be Arabic. And this is where you can actually uh, check the layout of your pages where it should be from right to left and left to right. So some of the views are correct and some are incorrect. So now you let an automated tool go and check this for you. You don't have to do it yourself. Accessibility detection. So one of the biggest things or in a lot of um, companies is their apps must be accessible for the seeing impaired. Whereas if you don't know what those accessibility labels are, it makes it obviously harder. You have to go through every screen on voiceover mode and hear what it's, it's, it's relaying back to you. But if you know what the accessibility labels are, you, and then you can map them to the UI, it adds that much more benefit. So as you can see here on the right, almost every element on that view has a label marked with a red dot. Whereas the view on the left only have a few, uh, few. And this will be good to know because now you can raise the question to the product owner or the developer saying, you know, should this view on the left have more than just these that are appearing? So now you know, and going forward, you could add more. So performance testing, just like you would test a, you know, website for its performance, or a desktop application, same applies for mobile apps. You know, nowadays it's not enough just to do UI automation or audit, manual testing to ensure quality, but you should know more about what's happening under the hood of your mobile application. Specifically, you know, you want to monitor the memory, the CPU, and the application size. And why is the application size important? Well, there's a lot of hard set limits in the app stores. So one, one limit is how large an application could be before you could install it over the air um, if you're not on Wi-Fi. And then the other one is the max allowable size that you can upload to the app store. So knowing the size is important in tracking it because then you can um, raise the issue to a developer if you start seeing the application size increasing so you can um, see if things could be pulled out of the application to make it smaller. And so it's not only important to get all this information, but actually store it so then you could benchmark it and then detect any you know, future trends 
uh, for your performance. So if you see your performance starting to decrease or maybe uh, the opposite, if it's increasing, now you know because now you have a benchmark. And same for the application size. So with all that said, you know, after my crawl, you know, I have all this information and I could take it and I can, I was able to um, generate a Google chart or a line graph with it. So it was great. Now I have, you know, after my test run, I could generate this uh, chart. However, it doesn't tell me a whole lot what's happening. You know, I know what my max CPU reached as it was testing and I know what the max memory is. But again, you know, and this goes to a lot of these charts that I've seen throughout my career. Um, it's not so much helpful. It just shows me what had happened, but I don't know what the app was doing in the current state. But since I have all the different images that I capture while I'm running, I could go ahead and then tag them to each tooltip. So I was able to do so. So the nice thing about this is I know exactly where the app was whenever these recordings were happening. So I could go in and manually check myself to see what was, you know, why the performance was what it was. But the other added benefit is I now have a sort of a playback from the beginning of the crawl to the end of the crawl to see exactly what I was doing. So language detection. So as, as you've seen, there could be lots of different screenshots generated for all the different combinations. And, you know, I was going through these manually scanning for any abnormalities of each image, which, you know, opens you up to human error. So I thought there had to be a better way of automating this part of the process. So I dug into learning all the open source translation libraries out there, and there's quite a few. There's probably, um, I probably used about seven different ones. You know, I tried all of them, but they didn't work. I could never get them to work that well. I got a lot of false positives back. And actually some did work really well, but you had to submit four or more words before it would give you the right language back. And of course, that's not gonna be helpful for applications with one word titles. So I ended up relenting and I, uh, paid for a service like Google Translate, which by far provided the best um, uh, results compared to any open source tools out there. And, and actually the cost wasn't all that much when you, when you run it through the translator, but you don't necessarily have to run the translation every time. You could just translate your app you know, prior to every release. So it's not something that has to be done every, all the time. So by that, I was able to generate reports because I have the images, I have all the strings on every view, and then I could go ahead and create the reports based on that information. So you can see here, this app is in set for in Spanish, but there's obviously a lot of English words being picked up. And unfortunately for our Spanish users out there using this app, they wouldn't know that this had the daily selection of the best content published on WordPress unless of course they spoke English or were able to read English. And here's another example. And you know, in the same token, you could get a lot of false positives because the crawler app, obviously when it detects the keyboards open, it's gonna start writing text. So a lot of this text in here are text that the crawler made itself. But in the library I use to do it, um, there's two reasons. One, it generates random strings and uh, the feature within the that um, library I'm using is a uh, hipster mode. Um, so I like that because it gives me this unique um, strings and I know right away that my crawler um, wrote that string. So I could did, you know, I could discard any of the um, words that got picked up by that. And the other token it, it was kind of funny. So log monitoring. You know, when performing exploratory testing, it's, you know, it's very important to monitor the logs. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, it's not enough just to, um, you know, manually test an application. Just looking at the application, you should always pull up the console or log and monitor the log as you're testing. 
because so many errors go unnoticed on the UI, such as network, API, or memory issues that you would never see unless you were actually monitoring the log. So the same applies for automated exploratory testing. You know, I want to detect if an error occurred and then record it or capture any exceptions and then shut everything down, all the different processes. And then I also wanted to take a screenshot when an error or exception occurred so I can add it to a bug. So app crash, and this will segue into this last topic. So here's an application that I use um, for a lot of um, AppBM workshops that I teach. And in this particular, it has a particular feature in the application that when, when you tap the button, it will crash. So it's it's perfect example for this test. And this is sort of an abbreviated version of what the whole crawl did, but at the final end of it, it tapped the crash button and ended up crashing. And everything shut down. But the added benefit is now I have the exception. It was captured as while I was running, and I could take this exception and send it to the developer to uh, resolve it. However, just like if you're doing exploratory or manual testing, you always want to make sure it's repeatable before you submit this bug. So since it's a machine, it doesn't forget, and it records every single step that it does, so I could easily just replay the last crawl that it did and val validate that that particular crash or error that was ever captured is actually an error. You know, I'm sure a lot of you can probably relate to this as you're testing, um, you encounter an error or a crash and you have no idea what you did. You know, I'm guilty of it. You know, sometimes I've spent hours trying to re reproduce an issue and not um, being, being able to. But since this is a machine, it doesn't forget. The added benefit to that is once the code fix has been made, if it was an issue, I can replay that particular test run and validate that, that the code fix is um, actually did fix it. And then outside of even a code fix, um, maybe I saw some strange performance um, um, data coming back. So I could take that performance data and go to the developer and maybe they could tweak it or do whatever to make it better. I could then, since I then have a benchmark, I could rerun the last test and see if the performance increased or decreased. So here's just a replay example. This is the same run as last time, but now you'll see all the steps that it did, but it will be much quicker because it's just doing the steps that it did to get to the crash. And again, this is going to crash because this is what this app is supposed to do. and it crashed again. But these are the same steps that happened last time, but had there been a code fix, this would have been a new version of the build. I could have validated that code fix still um, either crashed or didn't crash. So automatic tests. You know, after I built this entire framework, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, maybe I could take this one step further. You know, reviewing all those different screenshots for every single language, resolution, OS version, orientation, you know, it became very cumbersome. You know, also prone to human mistake. You know, you start looking at all these images, your eyes get glossy, and it's really easy to miss things. You know, and even, even if they're not big, or maybe it could be a small thing that just not easily uh, picked up on by looking at it yourself. So how could I automate that part of the process? An image validation with Apple tools. And just a bit of a disclosure, this was before I ever joined Apple tools, I implemented this, but by doing so, I saw the amazing power Apple tools or visual test automation brings to test automation. So by just passing in a couple of uh, different values like um, the current um, activity, uh, the current view, and if an element is present, I could then tell my framework to go ahead and take a snapshot 
and upload it to Apple Tools. And by doing so, I was able to just define tests without having to write any type of code. And the power that you get with visual test automation is your screenshot is your assertion. It's asserting every object on your page. So my title there, the hamburger on the top left, the button, the colors, if, if anything changes in the future, it will fail and then report back to me that something's changed in my application. So in the next slide, I'll show you the error. What I did was I changed the alert message to different text, reran the test again, and it caught the error. So this showed me that you know, I don't have to go and spend you know, you know, a couple hours writing page objects and all the methods to do the assertions. All I have to do is upload one simple snapshot and I'll know next time if anything ever changes in my application. So now I have automatic test. So chaos monkey. Sometimes we all need a little chaos. So monkey testers are important too. Um, some frameworks like the Android SDK have it built in. It's a powerful tool, but since I'm using Appium, I had to reproduce or um, re or essentially implement my version of monkey testing within Appium. So I took two different applications. The one on the left is Snapchat, obviously, and then the one on the right is Twitter. And then in the center is just a console output of random data that is it's doing while it's running. And it's just there for sample. It's not actually um, these applications currently running. So you can see it's going through, it's tapping, it's swiping, it's uh, doing all kinds of different actions. Here, um, you can see on the right, it's about the uh, tweet Best Buy, a cute little um, kitten gif. You can see the Snapchat is just tapping on random places on the screen. You know, it's much like I would do if I was trying to break the application. And it's also an important part of your testing process. You know, UI automation only codes, you know, will only test what you code it to do. And it's not gonna perform random actions like this that will help you find issues that you never thought about. Here's a good example, it's tapping on, on the left. You can see it did some swipe left, swipe right, just did a swipe down. It's tapping on random places on the screen. And essentially you just run this over and over again, or for however long you want to run it and see if something happens, the encounter is an issue. You can see here it's close to tweeting Best Buy, but it never gets there. Now it's about to tweet Best Buy. Uh, an internal picture on the device goes into this um, editing mode of the application, which is good because maybe you never go into that part. Maybe you don't interact with this um, maybe you don't have test automation for this. So again, it's, it's doing a lot of things that you don't necessarily have to then write tests for. And actually running this um, one time, I actually got Snapchat to crash. So that just reassured my belief that a, you know, a tool like this as part of your um, QA or development process is useful. It will find issues or crashes that you may not have ever thought about or coded for and had Snapchat used a tool like this or did something similar, they would have uh, caught this before it was ever released to the public. So some funny moments on my journey of building this. So when I was using uh, the crawler to go through uh, Twitter, you know, I created a new Twitter account. And what Twitter does when you don't have any followers or, um, or you're not following anyone, is it just fills your feed uh, by people near your location. And lucky for me, one of the um, people that I suggested in, or showed in my Twitter feed was my local police department. So I, I started letting it crawl Twitter and I walked away and I came back, you know, maybe 10 minutes later 
only to realize that it had tweeted hipster tweets to the police department uh, twice. So I quickly had to, you know, kill the crawler and then delete those tweets and, you know, block the police department from showing up on my feed. Uh, again, in Twitter, for whatever reason, um, these two were meant to find each other. There's this other Twitter bot or hipster bot, um, hipster Kanye, somehow found it on its feed, um, took its tweet, retweeted it with more hipster texts. So I guess the Twitterverse brought these guys together somehow. And as it was crawling through WordPress, you know, it goes through WordPress, it goes, creates its own blogs, comments on its own blogs, adds more content to its blogs automatically. And it will also go into other people's blogs and comment on their blogs with the hipster text. And so I had some rather um, unique comments left to me about these, uh, some comments that I can't actually display to you guys. And some of these people end up actually blocking me um, from there. And um, moral or the learning of this is I probably shouldn't have used my personal account while um, crawling through WordPress. So next time I will create an alias account. So the things to watch out for if you are going to crawl an application. So conclusion, you know, hopefully I have demonstrated to you you know, the benefits of you know adding a crawler or monkey tester to your development process or QA process. You know, as you can see, a, a machine is doing a lot of this work for you, and you don't have to do it. You know, and I do believe the rate of technology changes, especially in the machine learning side, that you know some form of app crawling could be the future of UI test automation or some form of it. I mean, there are a couple companies sort of in the space now. One's called AppDiff, they're in San Francisco, and they are doing something similar to what I just showed you, and they have machine learning engineers um, you know, making their crawling smarter. Another one is uh, Retest, and they're in Germany, and they, they too are doing um, crawling with machine learning. And I also just wanted to say I will be open sourcing this tool. So everything you saw, I will be open sourcing. Um, please, if you're interested in helping out, I could use the help. Um, please just email or tweet me. Um, really, anybody, any any, any skill it doesn't matter whether you're QA, um, you're great into JavaScript, so I could generate better reports. Um, another added benefit, especially on the Android side is I've already started to implement it, is running these in Docker containers. So not only can I spawn one Docker container, I could spawn up to thousands of Docker, Docker containers of all the different scenarios of languages and OS versions and get all this feedback in real time in, in parallel. So if you're into Docker and know a lot about that, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, and one other benefit to this outside of Android is since it's built on top of Appium, the Selenium uh, tool, it can run on any cloud service. So you can run it, you could tell the crawler to go ahead and connect to Sauce Labs or Browser Stack and all the different OS, or OS device combinations and crawl on those devices. And lastly, so I saw this image as, you know, maybe about a year ago or six months ago. And I thought it was very, it, said a lot to what I kind of went through while I was creating this, you know, and probably any, any of you that could relate that have spent some time de developing your own open source tools that, you know, when you first think about it, you're like, oh, it's the best idea ever. And then you, you definitely realize how hard it was and you started to like lose interest. You know, I definitely was in this dark swamp of despair for a while until I've crawled out a little bit. So I think I'm probably a little bit between the hmm and hey area, but I just thought this was very fitting. And that's it. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Hey, thanks, Justin. It was a very insightful session. So yes, we do have questions, but uh, I'm going to jump the queue and going to ask my question first. 
uh, how do you really keep yourself from throwing out getting thrown out of the system like doesn't the like if, if it's a software it's gonna detect the IP right that somebody's trying to crawl and pick up stuff like read the uh, and 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 as long as you're reading probably some lines or some lines of codes or some particular uh, components it's fine but if you're going to do that regularly for different uh, pages on the software isn't the ip getting i mean won't the ip get detected and you'll be thrown out uh, it, it's it's possible i mean ideally this tool is meant to be used for the software that you're developing on uh, but as you can see i it was able to extend it and use uh, applications that I'm not developing on. Um, so Twitter do, did go through lengths to make it so you couldn't easily do this, but I was able to figure them out and get around, um, able to you know, create an account and log into that account. Um, I suppose if I let it run, you know, over and over again, um, you know, for multiple times or days, it would detect it and maybe shut the account down. Um, so there is, you know, cases like that, they'll, they'll stop you, but Snapchat, I don't think there was any type of any check. I just created an account and started the app and it started crawling. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so let's get started with the attendee questions. First of all, it's uh, Valerie Potokov. I hope I'm saying the name right. And Valerie says hello to you and Moshe. And the question is, what is your approach to handle logs for errors? Are you parsing the test log? Is it a real-time um, stream processing or the batch processing after the test completion? And how effective do you find this approach? Yeah, a good question. Um, it is a streaming process. And I detect, I, I look for a key error, you know, I look for the word error or exception whenever those occur, and then I can shut that process down uh, when that current certain action happens. Um, I also filter the report to only, uh, well, I, I do two approaches, and I think the, the latter, what I'm doing now, is I, I used to filter it and just give me the applications, um, logs, but now I let the, I get the entire uh, system log, which will also include the app, app logs as well. Because I think that's important too, because there could be an error happening on the system that relates back to your device, and you would want to know about that too. So I, I, I get two. I get I capture the exception separately when it de detects it, but I also keep the entire log as well, so I can reference back and see what else was happening. So hopefully, that answered your question. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and if you want to ask again, please feel free, Valerie. Um, Okay, here is a question for the GitHub link for this crawler. I believe it's not yet there. It's not yet. It's um, yeah. so I'm in the process of cleaning up the code. You know, I've been really the only one developing this. So, um, you know, as and other engineers know this, when you're the only one doing it, you don't have to make things so clean. So I'm I've pretty much finished with that part. Now it's just I'm updating the documents, like the readme, and then once I do that, I'll um, publish the GitHub repo. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter or if you send me an email, I can send you the link once it's there. Okay, and um, so here's the question from Wayne saying, any thought uh, to using GIMP? I don't know what GIMP is. For, I, mean, I haven't come across it, but it says, uh, any thought to using GIMP to do image comparisons? I actually haven't heard of that tool either. Can you, what's the, I'll write it down. G I I um, we can also uh, share this question with you in case you want to research and respond to it later. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I haven't heard that tool, but I, I'll definitely take a look at it. Okay. And uh, Shaul asks, uh, what was the basis for the app crawler? What tech? Uh, the tech would be Appium. So that's the underlying framework to be able to um, automate the mobile applications on multiple platforms. Okay. And Robin asks, how are you using the term telemetry? Oh, telemetry. Yeah, that's, it's really just, it's analytics. Um, when I, I, when I worked at Microsoft, 
they refer to it always as telemetry. So it's essentially just another word for analytics. Um, basically, in, when you say analytics, it's, it's being able to report back to like an analytics software uh, telling, you, telling you what people are doing with your application. So if you click a button, there will, there will be a HTTP post call back to your server that would get fed into your analytics saying this user clicked this button um, to do something. So that's the, what analytics are usually for. OK. Um, now here is a question from uh, Michelle. Says, uh, very good presentation. Uh, but at some point, please explain why this approach is called exploratory, since the test cases seem to encompass a broad smoke test at the very least. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, to, just to add to it, to my mind, uh, as a tester, I think exploratory is anything where you are simultaneously learning and creating your test design and executing it. Uh, but yeah, Justin, please, if you want to add something to that. As to why you yeah, say sure. I think I think much like you commented on, it's it's sort of like you're you're given a new app. The first thing you do with an app, like or say a new build, is you start exploring it. You start you know clicking buttons. You do different actions. You see what that see what the app does. So in a way, you know, I want to automate that process and hopefully catch just catch issues before a human had to actually look at it. So. If I could have a machine or several machines test an application in all these different scenarios as it's doing exploratory testing, then a human doesn't have to necessarily do it, or it helps alleviate some of the work a human would have to do. So next question is, uh, if someone is new to automation and wants to learn this approach, what would you suggest uh, they do to prepare themselves to use this? Um, well, to use this particular tool, you wouldn't didn't have to do much. Um, I, so I built it as a CLI, so it's all packaged into a into its own. Um, so you can run it from the command line. All you have to do is uh, I've, you create like a manifest. Um, it's a Tomo document, it's similar to like um, a YAML, and you, you tell it you know what actions it can and cannot do, and you pass in like your usernames and passwords if it encounters a login. So from a learning standpoint, it wouldn't be too big. You just there would be some setup you have to do on your machine, like installing Appium and installing like the Android and iOS SDKs. But as far as that goes, um, it, there's not a whole lot. Um, but as far as far as automation, there's several. Um, you know, if you want to learn Appium, there's several um, websites out there dedicated to teaching you it. Um, Justin, would this tool actually have any dependency on the network? Like if you are on 2G or 3G or 4G network? Uh, it, well, it, it depends. It, no, not really. I mean, so it, it's meant to run um, from your computer locally. Um, I mean, if you, I, I think, I guess I'm taking the question as if the device itself was on those, on those networks, then no, it yeah. wouldn't. Yeah, it, no. The question, it will, is, uh, yeah. the question specifically says, how do you automate operating with a mobile app on a 2G or 3G or 4G network? Well, the SDKs actually have abilities to ch change the networks. So you can, um, and I don't have that built into this tool yet. Maybe I could add that as a feature. Um, but for any automation, you can set up the device to set it to which network you want, um, type, and then run it, and then run your application on that network, and it will simulate, you know, those speeds. So, mm -hmm. you, yeah, that's that's a follow-up thing. Uh, I think it's TJ Maher who sent it. The follow-up is, I mean, uh, does it detect those problems like simulating 3G? Oh, no, not currently. No, my my all, all the testing I've done is so far it's just been you know as it was connected to like uh, Wi-Fi, but those are mm -hmm. those are features. Those are those are great things to hear. And that, again, those are like if you if anybody wants to help out or you know it, even if it's not technical, you could give you know send send ideas or feature requests, and those would be helpful. See, that's <laughs> that's the benefit of being in the community. You get feedback <laughs> easy. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so, uh, here is the, uh, and I think we're already running over time. So this is the last question uh, that we are going to take. Is, is this, uh, and Jeff who's asking it, is this only for mobile applications? Right now it is. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned uh, prior before, since it's built on top of Appium, um, Microsoft recently released a, an extension to Appium to be able to automate uh, Windows desktop applications. So I, I do have a future, um, I, I do plan in the future to actually implementing that so I could actually crawl and do things on a desktop application for Windows. And then there's actually another uh, library somebody created to automate um, Mac client uh, applications, desktop applications with Appium as well. So I plan on implementing that too. So hopefully that answered your question there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. Uh, I think we're done with the questions here. And thanks uh, attendees, especially TJ, Andrew, Mike, and Bain for letting us know what GIMP is. So I'm going to share those details with everybody where we can find the details for GIMP. So Justin, thanks for your time today. It was a very insightful session on um, how to crawl and not be thrown out of the system. Um, OK, actually, many thanks for talking about automated exploratory testing and uh, how to go about it and for sh also sharing your funny moments. I really like the Snapchat one. Uh, Great, thank you. Yeah, loved the audience engagement and questions, so I'm sure uh, our attendees found it very informative and useful too. So thanks again, Justin, and I hope to see you in California. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And um, many more uh, thanks, importantly, for being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and for the whole group. Stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon. And if you haven't yet signed up for the upcoming webinar, which is Defect Metrics for Organization and Project Health by David Balak. Bialik. I'm, I'm sorry, David, if you're listening and I'm saying it wrong. It's David Bialak on 13th of December. The link is up for registration at softwaretestpro.com. So go ahead. And thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in California in April 2018.